bit of a brainstorm. Um, then we're going to be leading into a debate and I'll be discussing about how I use debates as a teaching tool in classes to varying degrees of success. Um, <laughs> So first of all, I think it's probably a good idea that we all throw out the ideas that we currently face or believe that we will be facing when teaching the postgraduate student cohort in small groups. Um, uh, the sort of class-based face-to-face with small groups, um, I've been to find in previous experience the difficulty of encouraging people who are very quiet and don't want to participate versus those that are, will otherwise dominate uh, a group session. So it's striking a balance yeah. between encouragement and gentle limitation. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. In the small group learning environment, when you have a say a tutorial, you're going to discuss a topic and there's been pre-circulated reading or matter, but always a proportion in my experience of about 50% of students who arrive have not read it and it makes it very difficult then to have a discussion on the content. Yeah. And some of the students are quiet because they just haven't done anything. Yeah. The um, students in the MBT program, because they've got to have done four years of work, um, previous work experience, but don't necessarily have to have a, an undergraduate qualification, don't necessarily come with the right academic skill set. So they can't actually do the assignments very well, the first attempt at the very first assignment. We're going to overcome that by developing something, um, a, a little training session for week zero, because we don't actually use week, what's now week zero, um, we won't be using it next year, so we're developing something for that, but the problem is they're just not getting up to speed quick enough, especially the brand new students. Yeah, I think the most favourite is often that the background of students is very, very much more varied, so that that's, can be an issue sometimes, yeah. Danny? Yeah. Similar, to that, sorry, similar to that situation, when teaching business students, especially our professional students, there's always a sense of difficulty to balance theory and practice. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. In relation to students uh, wanting more practice often? Sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I said they were assessment driven. So the yeah, students yeah. in medicine they were very assessment driven. And if they perceive something's not assessed, then it's not worth putting any effort into. Yeah. And that's always what I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was going to kind of go on that basis of skill sets and the fact that post grad students are from so many diverse backgrounds and levels of skills. The expectations, like understanding the level of expectations say in assessments or group work or, or things like that seems to be a bit of a problem to get a benchmark. Yeah. So now that we have all of these <laughs> all of these problems that we face, hopefully um, what we're going to do today is develop ways in which we can meet some of these issues. Um, obviously not solve them, but how we can address them in different ways so that we feel that we're equipped with an arsenal of tools, of potential tools that we can use. When one strategy isn't working, we can try something else. Because as I'll talk about later, and I'll actually show you my um, cat eye and my teaching feedback across various teaching strategies to let you know that something will work in one session and then it completely dies in the next semester, so you never really know. Um, so, what I want to start with is something that a lot of my students have said that they find valuable with regards to their um, learning experience and that is using debate because they're interacting with each other and not just the facilitator. So in order to address the efficacy of doing debates, I want us to do a debate, mini debate. Since we can see that there are a lot of online and face-to-face -face issues, we'll have a very short mini-debate about whether face-to-face -face students get a better education than distance students. The way I organise a debate is I divide the class into three. We have an affirmative, a negative and the jury. Ten minutes preparation, ten minutes discussion, ten minutes debrief. And the affirmative sits there and they decide what their argument is and write down all of their points. The negative does the opposite. And the jury sits there and divides a piece of paper into and say, right, what are the arguments we're looking for in the affirmative? What are we looking for in the negative? And then ticks it off as we go. And then we discuss what all of the compelling arguments were and the pros and the cons. Uh, the first argument that we have of why we feel that face-to-face -face students are getting a better education is um, most importantly that they get to engage with a real life flesh person. Um, and interestingly enough, that's what they are too. So they've got an immediate identity with you as um, being someone that they can relate to. Um, the other um, point about that is 
that because you're in the classroom with them, the um, way that you can build rapport on a level um, of normal social interaction is greater and um, more immediate uh, than if you were um, having to type uh, messages in and show your static um, face, unless you're lucky enough to have video. Um, and that what is going on there is um, an engagement with the student on an, another level that isn't just a cerebral level. There's an emotional and a social um, interaction going on as well. Great. So, negative, what say you? Well, in response to that, uh, we'll start off by saying that that very presence can also be a, a large negative. It's threatening to some students to have the physical presence. They would rather they come to the course to engage with the intellectual process and they find the social and physical processes sort of quite threatening for cultural reasons, just for personality reasons and so forth. So for, for online people, there's a, a sense, there's an ability to be anonymous, um, to actually avoid face-to-face, flesh-to-flesh contact, um, uh, and that's a, that's a benefit to their learning. They can concentrate more on the content. Um, should we make it positive? Yes. Um, the other thing is that in assembling people into that situation is in a sense old technology. And these days when you look at the cost, resources, time, money that it costs to actually have places like this where people physically meet, as opposed to the cost of people meeting virtually, um, there's a large, uh, it, it's very hard to sustain an argument for face-to-face -face teaching. Um, as, as a process, as a technology, when there's so many other better technologies around for people communicating much cheaper and much more efficiently. And online and information technologies are an aid to the learning process. Absolutely. We are not advocating that it replaces entirely face to face, but it is a valuable learning tool which can assist students in their learning and prepare them appropriately so when they come together in a face to face setting, they're as well prepared as they might otherwise be. I don't think we're advocating that we wouldn't ever we allow online yeah. either. So <laughs> <laughs> I think you've just validated our point, which we made was that not all things can be done online. <laughs> 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 you turn around and say, well, these online technologies are human technologies that have been developed by people. They're not, they're not opposed to people, they're not opposed to real flesh and blood people, they're, they're, they're our own creations. And your argument exactly proves our point, which is that this is, this is a human creation and something that we have developed and adapted to. And it's something that we ought to use in that way. One of the other things I want to say is that exactly what you say about other things happening can happen online, in fact, even more, because it's a very rich resource and many things can happen at once. It's not like in a classroom where one thing happens in a fairly sort of serial. I understand other things are happening in the classroom, but it's a fairly serial process. Online, you can have many parallel processes running and you're Googling on the side and you're you know, trying your Facebook page on the side as well. It's a very rich experience that can happen online and all those sorts of um, things that are triggered from, from what's actually supposed to be happening can happen online just as easily. In summary, in a positive way, in an increasingly complex world where people are engaged in many different activities and responsibilities, the capacity to interact with your peers at times that suit you is very valuable for effective time management learning. And the capacity to be able to go back in and re-record, re-listen, re-read information that's been shared means that students can be incredibly well prepared when it comes to the assessment point at the end. And ultimately, the global phenomenal success of Facebook, MySpace, and internet dating proves that chemistry across the sure. <laughs> 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 It's uh, three for the next two, it's pretty close. And, we, and what we believe is neither team has actually addressed the outcomes. Like, is there any evidence for a face-to-face -face teaching is better than... So neither team provided any knowledge of evidence that way. And neither team addressed the issues of synchronous or asynchronousity of the development of the program to meet the style of student learning 
and the fact that some students may be slower than, the, than others and suited to um, different styles. So yeah, that's just... <laughs>